Um, as, we, as we get started, really, uh, I want to really do the same thing that I did um, when I gave this presentation at Western. Um, it's a little more effective at Western because we were in the space at the time, but I think it can definitely be effective now. Um, I just really want you to imagine yourself in a segregated space. Um, so African Americans on one side of the room, uh, whites on another side of the room, uh, as well as lockers for African Americans all being clumped into one spot, uh, this particular spot being closest to the main office in the building. Um, and this is, this is history that's not necessarily from the 50s or 60s or, or 70s. This was my own experience um, as a graduate of Western Albemarle. So I graduated in 1999. Um, this was my experience in the building that when we gave, when I gave this presentation at Western, we did, I did the presentation in that space. Um, so as we move forward, I just want you to imagine yourself in that space. Um, so I really want to start off here. Um, the, the purpose of this presentation is really to understand that history is the present. And um, I really want to talk about how through the buildings uh, that we frequent every day, the experiences that we have, the, uh, the learned experiences that we have from our ancestors, from our elders, um, that that history is still present in the spaces and places that we go and the experiences that we have every day. In this particular place, Castle Hill, many may know of it as a cidery. They go here for weddings, go here for wine. Um, that is the image on the left. The image on the right is Castle Hill as a slaveholding plantation. My own ancestors were enslaved here uh, at Castle Hill. This is the one headstone uh, for a slave that's buried at Castle Hill. All the others are unmarked. This is actually my own ancestor, Colin Bird. He died in 1887. He was the coachman uh, at Castle Hill. He left in emancipation. He came back to die at Castle Hill. He's buried there today. So as we move forward, um, as we move from, from, from the slavery segment, um, we talk about Meriwether Lewis. When Meriwether Lewis, we have a school named after Meriwether Lewis, the explorer. Um, but Meriwether Lewis was a slaveholder. Um, he inherited slaves um, in his home, Locust Hill, which is right near the school on Owensville Road. Um, so I really want, want everyone to understand, um, of once again, the places, the examples of these places um, that we see every day, that we frequent, um, that have a deeper history, a different history than what we typically experience on a daily basis. So this is really example number one of, of one of these spaces. So we come to 18, 1865. Now, what I really want you to understand is that education has always been important to African Americans, um, even prior to coming to this country in bondage. And the first thing that African Americans did after emancipation was to build a church and to build a school. Typically, these were right next to each other. A lot of times, they had the same name. This school here is the St. John School. It was built right after emancipation in a place called Cobham, Virginia, um, which no longer really exists on the map, but it's now morphed into Keswick or, or Gordonsville. Um, notice this building has, of course, no running water. Um, the main thing is no windows, and we'll get into that in a minute here. This school here is one of those schools that is in the Western Feeder Pass. This is Hillsboro School. Um, this building still stands. It looks like, uh, like it does in this picture today. It is right across the street from Piedmont Baptist Church. A lot of the students that went to this school are still around today um, to share their, their experiences. Um, this building here, of course, is in, is in disarray. And like I say, it's directly across the street from one of these churches, um, which is typical. This is what this school looked like um, in its heyday. The inside, you'll notice the pot belly stove, which if you ask some of these students that, that went to these schools, this is really a focal point of these schools uh, to, heat the, to heat the building, uh, as well as for cooking. This is another one of these schools uh, in the Western feeder pattern. This is Terry School. Now, a lot of these schools are no longer around. Uh, 
some of them are. This particular school is still standing. It is a private home uh, in Ivy, right around the corner from Mary Elementary School, across Dry Bridge. Uh, my grandparents actually went to this school. Um, it is now a private home, and it looks the same way that it does in this picture now. And I mentioned the first school that we saw that had no windows. Um, so this brings us to this slide. Um, Rosenwald schools. Now, there were seven Rosenwald schools built in Albemarle County. There were over 5,000 built throughout the South um, between 1917 and 1932. And this was a partnership between Booker T. Washington and the then uh, president of Sears Roebuck, uh, Julius Rosenwald, to build these, these schools that were the better spaces for education for African Americans. And one of the main things about these structures um, one was that they had a large bay of windows to bring in natural light. Um, nowadays, we talk about uh, multi-age spaces. Um, in these schools, of course, you would teach grades one through eight all in the same room. Um, and also, a big thing is that the communities actually built these schools. So the funding came partly from the county, partly from the community itself, uh, and partly from the Rosenwald Fund and then the people from the community actually built, built the school themselves. This is the St. John Rosenwald School, the one that replaced the shack looking building. Um, this one was built in 1922, and it still stands today. It's the only Rosenwald School in Alamar County that's still standing. And it is on the uh, State Registry of Historic Places as well as the National Registry. brings us to Alamore Training School. So after going to one of these schools, one of the seven Rosenwald schools or one of these other schools, like the Terry School or Hillsboro or Whitehall or Browns Cove, um, you would go to, to Alamore Training School or you would go to Esmont High School, which a lot of people uh, don't know it, it existed, but it was on the same property that BF Yancey is, is on today. This was the main high school um, for the county. It was right down the street from where Albemarle High School is located now. There is a small uh, marker that's kind of under a box hedge. You can hardly see it um, from the street, but it's in front of the business right past the, the rock store on the left that marks that space. Uh, Mary Clark Greer was a uh, principal at this school. And um, that brings us to our, our next slide, actually. Mary Clark Greer, um, beloved teacher, uh, in this area. She was principal at the Albemarle Training School. And uh, she also, her, her father was Hugh Carr, uh, the owner of Riverview Farm, which is now the Ivy Creek Natural Area. The Ivy Creek Natural Area is actually composed of uh, multiple properties owned by African Americans that were actually in the education system in the county, in, in, in Albemarle County. Um, so, uh, you have Hugh Carr, Mary Carberry's father. You also have uh, Mr. Jesse Sammons, um, who was a principal at Albemarle Training School as well. Um, and it brings us to Virginia L. Murray. Virginia L. Murray actually got her start as a teacher at the St. John School. She was also the superintendent of the black schools. And of course, we have a school named after her. Um, interesting fact. So, a lot of people don't know that Mary Elementary was an all-black school. My mother went to that school. Um, I actually graduated from Mary Elementary School, and in my own personal experience, this is another one of those examples of how, about how history um, still lives with us today. So I graduated from from Mary Elementary School. Prior to that, I was at Mary uh, Mary with Lewis. Uh, redistricting happened that year. That was 1991, um, and during that time. Uh, Murray High School was in that space. It moved to its current location. Murray Elementary School was reopened as an elementary school. Where the line was drawn for students to come from Murray or the Lewis to go to Murray, that was all the African American students. So the African American students transitioned from Murray or the Lewis back to the former all black elementary school during that time, and that was 90, 91. Um, now in my own experience, I was actually, there wasn't a lot of African Americans. I was only, I was one of only two in the fifth grade that year. Uh, went 
back before their graduation in 2016, there was one in the fifth grade at Murray. That one was the daughter of the other that was that graduated with me, my cousin, um, that lived right on that road. So this brings us to Brown versus Board, 1954, of course, um, where it was federally stated that segregation uh, was unlawful. I'm going to play a quick clip from you for you. Um, city, county, very much linked uh, during this time, especially with the, uh, the building of Burley, which we'll get to. Uh, but I'll play a quick clip for you. Well, I think it's horrible. I just, I don't know, we're just all losing our education for just two colored people. You accept things, but when you try to force something upon people, you can't do it. I mean, you figure this is the South and this is America. It's supposed to be free. What do you think about this? All I've got to say is I'm a segregationist by a long way. And I'll tell you, I'm very staunch on the deal. And I'm going away to school this year because of it. I've been to Lane all my life, all my high school life. And I'm leaving going to private school this year because of it. So I played this, played this clip for you. This um, was during massive resistance. So these students are talking about how they're not going to school um, because schools are going to be integrated. And of course, we're sitting in that space today, right now. Um, so it's very relevant. Um, but during that time, what happened, and this happened in different parts of the state as well, um, is that these private segregation academies were created. And this was done in the city, um, not in the county. The county was not um, uh, part of that court order, so the county did not close schools um, during that time. Um, but I wanted to show you this just because it's relevant. This is Rock Hill Academy, which is right down the street from us. Uh, this is one of the two private segregation academies uh, that opened in Charlottesville City um, to, to educate white students that no longer uh, were going to, to Lane. This was deemed unlawful, um, not because it was a private segregation academy, but because they were using public funds uh, to fund these, these schools. The other school was uh, Robert E. Lee Elementary, which is where the Autism Society is now, right around the corner from uh, Burley High School. So this is an article from 1954 by James Rorty. And he states, if integration is uh, practicable in Norfolk, with 39% of Negroes in its school population, why isn't it practicable in Albemarle County in Central Virginia with only 21%. It just isn't, replied Dr. E.J. Oglesby, professor of mathematics at the University of Virginia, who had served on the Albemarle County School Board. Not in this part of the world in the foreseeable future. This was also the conclusion of Dr. Paul Kale, the Albemarle County School Superintendent. White parents would not permit their children to receive instruction from inferior Negro teachers and they were inferior, Dr. Kale said, citing instances of misconduct by Negro school principals. He declared that an MA from Columbia didn't necessarily make a Negro teacher either professionally competent or trustworthy. And of course, we have a school named after Dr. Kale today, um, which my, uh, my six-year-old is actually a student. Once again, another example of how the spaces um, that we frequent daily have a different type of history, not necessarily the building itself, but um, the name behind it. And this brings us to 1950. Now, we've heard, we hear a lot about massive resistance in the state of Virginia, but we don't often hear about passive resistance, which early is a product of. So passive resistance was okay, we know the Brown versus Board is coming down the pipe. Um, so what we're gonna do is if we build a brand new school for African Americans uh, with all the bells and whistles, they won't want to integrate. The product of that here is Burley High School. Now Burley High School, of course, ended up becoming a great sense of, of, of pride for its graduates. My grandmother was in the first graduating class in 1951 from, from Burley High School. Again, what did the Negroes expect to happen next, asked Dr. Kale. 
what did they want? He had been trying to find out. But where formerly his Negro principals had been willing to talk frankly with him, now they refused to confer except publicly in the presence of their entire staffs. This was after um, Burley was built. Um, so it was looked at as if, you know, what are they, what else do they want? They have a brand new shiny school. Um, and that was, uh, was used as a, as a pacifier. Now, this brings us to, to this slide here in 1956. And this is once again an example of how um, history is very much still with us in the present. It's not as uh, ancient or far away um, as we often may think. Now, this is the 1956 General Assembly. This is where the Pupil Placement Board was developed. Um, so the Pupil Placement Board, a lot of people think that when integration happened, or, or desegregation rather, um, that all the students just moved and, and, and went to, to white schools. And of course, white students did not go to black schools, but also it was not a, a mass integration. Um, the Pupil Placement Board selected certain students and they had to apply um, to integrate these schools. And that's why you, you hear about small numbers of students, those initial students that integrated schools. And the example here really is the statue of Robert E. Lee in the back of the room. So once again, the past is very much present with us. Now this is very timely because Halloween is coming up. We often see this type of thing in national news at universities, at high schools, um, around Halloween time, and it's a, a big controversy. But this um, is actually a blackface minstrel show um, from 1962-63 year at Albemarle High School. And this was actually in the Albemarle High School yearbook um, as one of the events that happened that year um, that they held a, a blackface minstrel show. So once again, um, the past is very local. Um, it's not so distant or far off um, as often we may think. Which brings us to 1963. So this is the year that um, Albemarle County Schools integrated, nine years after um, Brown versus Board. Now, when Brown versus Board came down, they said, with the all deliberate speed, which basically means you can take your time, right? Um, so, you know, five years later, the city, the city of Charleston integrates nine years um, after 1954, uh, Albemarle County integrates. And this is a very important year in American history in general, right? Um, we have the four little girls being bombed uh, in Birmingham. We have the March on Washington. Um, George Wallace in front of the, in front of the, uh, the, the steps there. Um, and also, that was also the same year that Martin Luther King came to the University of Virginia to speak. So desegregation here in Albemarle County, September 3rd, 1963. Albemarle County integrated, integrated three of its schools initially. Um, actually, two came first, and like the next day, uh, the third came. So Stone Robinson um, had 17 students, Greenwood had three, Greenwood Elementary, and Albemarle had uh, five. Now, you'll see, you'll notice the numbers that's 17 of 18, 3 of 6, 5 of 8. Um, that's because on that first day of school, all of the students that were um, supposed to um, change schools and go to these schools did not um, for whatever reason. Um, I do know that some decided, at least at Burley, um, some seniors that were, that were going to go decided um, that they would stay at Burley. They didn't want to take that chance. And, especially if they were in their senior year, they were comfortable and they wanted to stay and finish out their senior year there. Um, now at this time, we have Dr. Dr. Kale saying, we are pleased but not surprised that we have had a normal first day of school this year, said uh, school superintendent Paul H. Kale. This is from uh, the Daily Progress. Once again, those numbers are directly related to that pupil placement placement. So once again, I want to play you this clip because I really want you to, to be able to hear the stories directly um, from people who experienced it um, and, and understand those stories. So the 
lady on the right, and we have another one coming up. They actually, uh, their, stu their children integrated uh, Stone Robinson. So they're gonna talk a little bit about what that experience was like for them. And these people, uh, the lady on the right and the left, are both still with us today in Prairie in the community. The um, minister of our church was from Charlottesville, Reverend Dr. R.A. Johnson. And he came one morning in his long black Cadillac and he picked up Annie and Dickerson, Elizabeth Yates, and Pauline Young and says, uh, I want to take you all. And Pauline said to me, Bernice, Colette will be going to school uh, next year. So please come on and go ride with me. Because we were just like that. Pauline and I were inseparable. <laughs> and so I was in the Cadillac with them. So Reverend Johnson drove on up to the Stone Robertson School. And during that time, it was a woman teacher, a tall woman called, named Anna Watson. And when she, Reverend Johnson said, now you all sit quietly right here in the car. Don't move, don't get out anything, and I'm going to the door. So when he walked to the door, the principal at that time was Miss Anna Watson. She slammed the door in his face, and he turned around and came on back to the car. He said, she slammed this, that's the principal. She slammed the door in my face. He said, but I'm coming, going back, because I'm going straight to Charlottesville to the county school board. And we went there and he said, I don't want you all to say a word. Just be quiet and I'll do the talking. And they didn't give us no, uh, we had to go over there. And I know my Pauline went, I went, Robin Johnson, uh, Helen, did they leave the name? She ain't gone, them sister. She went with us. And all of us went over, over there and over to Stone Robbins to, to forget the school. We're going to stand over here and to put the children in the school. They thought they won't give us no, no uh, a people to fill out anything for them. So they were going to stop you from Just kept on sending you to the uh, county office building. We went to the county office building. They said, no, they got the, the, the school thing at the school. I said, well, you just sat here from the county office from the school. They told us to come to the county office building. He said, no, we don't have them here. I'm just running you around, you know, didn't want to give them to you. The one of the teachers, she, Miss Nicholas, I know we'll forget that woman. She's a black teacher, and she told her over at Stone Robinson. And she stands up in front of the, the uh, desk, at her desk, and said, no, we don't have any people here to fill up. I said, yes, she do, because the man just told us she had them here. We've always been up to the stand. I said, move away from that desk. So she moved, and I look in the drawer, and there were all the papers. There were the forms that we filled out. So I just took the form, though, and then gave them to everybody to fill out. That was Miss Bernice Mitchell, um, who's graduated of Alamont Training School. Uh, Miss Geraldine Johnson here, um, who has since passed. Uh, her daughter actually teaches in our school system, um, and she is a graduate of, she's the first graduating class of Burley High School as well. There's Ms. Johnson on the right, and there's Reverend uh, R.A. Johnson on the left who worked uh, very hard to integrate schools here in Albemarle County. This is a clipping from, from the Daily Progress. This was when uh, schools were being integrated here in the county. Um, and with this, um, I'd like to announce actually that I brought this idea to, to Dr. Haas um, for Albemarle County to recognize, uh, identify and recognize those initial uh, 25 students that integrated Albemarle County schools at uh, Albemarle High School, Greenwood Elementary, and Stone Robinson. Um, so uh, we will be working on that, on identifying and, and recognizing those students um, and uh, writing application for Virginia Historic Road marker. 